Hello, everyone. Welcome to Pens of Politics. I am with Christian Watson. I am your host, Christian Watson. And today I have with me a very special guest, Mr. Yaron Brook, uh, chairman of the uh, Ayn Rand Institute, you know, but a best-selling author, you know, speaker, public intellectual, one of my favorite public intellectuals of this day, actually. And so I'm just, I am a avid watcher of his podcast, of his show. And I think that his message of objectivism, whether whether I entirely endorse it or not, I mean, mostly I do, is still very important for a lot of minds to hear and a lot of minds to see. So, Mr. Brook, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thanks, Christian. Thanks it's for having a, me on. It's a, yeah, before I get into the deep questioning and everything, how are you handling or dealing with the coronavirus pandemic? Well, I'm kind of under, under lockdown, have been for a long time, because Puerto Rico is one of the first places to really lock people down. And so it's, it's been... It's been, I don't know, six weeks now or something since yeah. uh, since middle of March. Um, it's difficult. Uh, I have to say I've been working harder and longer hours than, than usual yeah. um, because there's just so much to do. Uh, and I haven't been traveling at all, which wow. is very strange for me. As you know, I, I'm usually, last, uh, last travel was March 13th uh, when, I, uh, when I flew to Denver to give a talk. But I uh, haven't been traveling, I haven't traveled since then, so... Um, it, that which is very strange for me, very strange. But I have been doing a lot of things like this, a lot of lectures online, and I, I manage a hedge fund, and and it's been a pretty intense time in the financial market. So absolutely, uh, that's been intense. But overall, I'm doing. We're doing well. We're doing well. Get a little frustrated. I wish the restaurants would open already. I'm. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm eager for a nice sit down at a at a nice restaurant. Oh yes, I I, I can fondly uh, recall you saying that since you believe in the division of labor and services to those who specialize in it, you prefer to get stuff from restaurants as opposed right. to picking it yourself. That's right. <laughs> absolutely. That's right. Which absolutely. makes life difficult in a, in a, in a lockdown. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Well, so I think objectivism and uh, go, going to the topic, which we're going to talk about objectivism and this sure. pandemic and the idea of public health and capitalism. I think objectivism in this time is more needed than ever, primarily because the core objectivism, even if you don't endorse the entire system of objectivism, the, 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 the epistemology, the aesthetics or what have you, yeah. the core objectivism is a reliance on the individual and a focus on the individual and emphasis on the individual. And during this pandemic, I would dare say that a lot of individuals are being, their, their potentials are being smothered unduly by uh, heavy handed government action. For example, a lot of people in Michigan have been quite, uh, have been quite rebellious against the uh, gov Governor Whitmer, who uh, was plainly said, I wanna protect life which would make you believe, if you're from the natural rights tradition, that yep. she has an actual interest in preserving liberty as well, because those things are indispensable. But in all reality, she has no interest in doing either of that. The interest that she has is simply using her arbitrary definition of, of, of life and essentializing categorizing, categorizing all of that and doing something that will appease her base. So my question for you is, all of that, and this is several other governors have done this on the basis of a very foul, foul presupposition, in my opinion, the idea of public health. Yep. Now, when they say public health, to me, that is a misnomer, because health to me is a very personal thing. It is a very individual thing, right? It, you don't, you, when you go to a doctor, they do not estimate your way, they do not estimate your, your history on the basis of everyone else. Yep. And so objectivism, being interested in, in ideas about the individual, how, how does objectivism answer the folly, I, I would call, of public health? How does it view public health? Well, I, I, I think as a governmental um, function, public health, for the most part, is an illegitimate function of government. I think there is, a, there is one function of government when it comes to health, and that is when you are threatening me because of your health, when you have a contagious disease that I might get, then it's the government's job to protect me. It's the government's job to isolate you. Uh, and of course, it's tricky because what constitutes a infectious disease, how bad, we obviously don't want the government intervening when we have the common cold or even the flu, but when do we want it to intervene? And these are tricky political questions. These are Indeed. not easy to answer. So the only area I think so-called public health, and I, I agree with you, I don't like the term, is a government function is in times like this when, it's, it, when we're talking about infectious diseases. But of course, what has happened is the government has defaulted on its actual responsibility, which is protecting individual rights. Uh, if you look at the government of South Korea, surprisingly, it is the model for how to deal with a pandemic 
in a way that actually respects and protects rights. No lockdowns, no even travel bans, really, or very minimal travel bans. But what they did was they did what a government should do during a pandemic. They tested. Uh, and testing can be done privately. It doesn't even have to be the government doing it. Mm -hmm. But then what the government needs to do is isolate and trace. Trace who you've interacted with, mm -hmm. warn those people, potentially test those people, but, prevent, but then isolate you, right, if you test positive. That's all the government should be doing, right? It should be engaged in the activity that isolates the threat. And the threat is you carrying the disease. It's not me who is just going about my life uh, and who doesn't have that disease yet. Yeah. Let me push back a little bit on that because sure. I think you've, you've, you've just postulated the idea of, uh, of, of contact tracing. Yeah. And contact tracing has been a very controversial point for many people, especially in America, especially those who are of the more patriotic vein, uh, and because primarily because it, it gives it gives government, uh, well, private firms vis-a-vis -vis the gov government's blessing and, and, uh, and leeway into someone's life in a way that might be obtrusive or, or might be or they didn't they didn't consent to. Uh, but I think the point you're touching on that it, to protect. To, to protect general public health or to protect the, the general... Protect the individuals and protect, protect the individual the, rights. Protect and look, individual health, yeah. You know, my view is at a time of a pandemic in a, in a rational society, <laughs> Congress would actually convene and declare a state of emergency, not the president. This right. is not the executive right. branch. This needs to be a legislative branch. You might even consider, given that we're talking about tra uh, tracking and tracing and things that that could potentially engage, uh, be violations of rights and we're giving the government special powers during right. an emergency. Uh, you could even imagine the Supreme Court having to come, or a state Supreme Court or a federal Supreme Court coming together so it's not politicized to say, yes, given the, given the data, this is truly an emergency and we are granting the executive this very narrow band of permissions in terms of what to do. Not to lock people in their homes, not to punish, but to be able to see who an right. infected person interacted with. Now, Indeed. you would think, by the way, that somebody who is innocent but who interacted with an infection person would want to know it because it's valuable to their life to uh -huh. know that they interact with somebody who has the virus. So I don't, I don't consider this a violation of rights. It, it is uh, in an emergency. I, I think it is to protect your rights. The whole point of this is to protect your rights. Mm -hmm. And it has to be delimited. It has to be finite in length. And, and the whole point of declaring an emergency has to be, here's the criteria by which it goes away. An executive branch has to burn all the information it has and, it, and the whole function has to disappear. So very important to delimit. Emergency measures are fine under extreme circumstances. I, I'll give you another example. I'll give you an example where lockdowns are legit, right? Here's a real, right? Imagine that in well, your neighborhood, yeah. imagine in your neighborhood, the government discovers that there is a uh, terrorist cell that is about to execute a terrorist act. And there's somewhere in your neighborhood, and let's say it's within a square mile or two square miles, and they have deployed special forces teams to try to catch these terrorists. And if people just came out of their homes and walked around, it would be, you know, their lives would be endangered. They might be crossfire. They might be you know, for the period of hunting down the terrorists, there is a decree that says within this mile, that's it, not the whole city, not the whole state, but within this mile, we are locking people down. You cannot leave your home, stay home while we execute this police activity. Indeed. Indeed. So again, it's delimited, it's finite. We know when it ends, when the terrorists are caught and it can't take longer than X number of hours. Mm -hmm. And it's to protect your rights. It's to protect you and it's, over, right? Mm -hmm. So it, again, emergency situations do require emergency uh, actions by the government, but they have to be objective. They have to be delimited and the threat has to be real. Yes. Yeah, so it, that's, that's very interesting. And I think all, all, all that is correct. If there was a terrorist cell in my, in my general proximity, I would, I would want the police or people who are better equipped than I am to come in and help me because I don't want to fight terrorists on my own. Um, yeah. you know, uh, and that's why governments are instituted of, 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 among men if you believe in the classical liberal tradition. Uh, but the, 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 the primary problem that I see is the fact that a lot of these things are predicated upon 
government knowledge, right? The, the sort of extent of this virus has literally been quite pre predicated upon a few agencies, the CDC, the WHO, and everything, and, 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 and subordinates. And well, so- Well, remember, the WHO is not a U.S. government agency. It's not, but it is- I would it, actually it, argue that- It has a, it has a pernicious- yeah. If our politicians actually listened to the CDC, we'd be in much better situation today than we are. That is, I, I, I think that it's the politicization of this mm -hmm. crisis. Mm -hmm. And the incompetence primarily of the FDA, which has prevented the testing, tracking, isolating, which the South Koreans were so good at. We delayed primarily because we have no political leadership and because our political leadership is much more focused on being elected or in posturing than they are in actually protecting our rights. Mm -hmm. And if, 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 if this, because if you look at the CDC plans right. for a pandemic, before this pandemic, they were pretty good and they did not involve lockdowns. There's no plans in the CDC inventory in the past right. that involves locking people down by force. And yet they were never allowed to execute those plans. Would you say that by the nature of government acting on something, the matter automatically becomes political because politics is the is that which concerns government. So I think that anytime a bureaucracy or government <laughs> lumbers or moves to fix a situation or to address it, it automatically becomes political. So I think that it's a little bit hard well, to avoid. Political in a different it. sense. That's true. I mean, by definition, that's a tautology. By definition, yes, it's political. But political in a sense of today as being about getting reelected and being about slamming the other side. And are you a mm -hmm. Democrat? Are you a Republican? Is it a red state? Is it a blue state? Or, or so on. Mm. That's very different. And that has become worse and worse and worse in America over the last 100 years. And the bigger the government, the more intrusive the government, the more power the government has, the less engaged it is in, in, in protecting individual rights, mm -hmm. and the more it engages Precisely. in political posturing, in seeking re-election, in attacking the other side, the more tribal it becomes. And I think over the last two administrations, primarily with, with Obama and now with Trump. We have become tribal and our government has become Certainly. a government that is more about appeasing its base. It's more about feeding its base and particularly with Trump more than any other president and I think in American history. It's become, you know, are you Republican or are you Democrat? That's, that's the measure of truth now. That's the measure of loyalty. Not what does the science say? What is the best plan? How do we save individual rights? What's good for America, right? If, if you really believe in make America great again, it wouldn't matter if you're a Republican or Democrat, you would just be focused on what is good for the individuals within the country. But of course, this administration, past administration. So it's, it's big government, expanded government, unlimited government really. It's really the unlimited nature of government that, that causes the problem in the crisis and in, in particularly in the health crisis, the fact that the government is so involved in our health, in, 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 uh, in hospitals. Do you know why we have so few hospital beds in the United States? Because in order to add, let's say I wanna build a new wing in my hospital, add beds. Let's say I wanna do it for just emergencies, just for pandemics or something. I need to apply to the state in order to get permission. And I have to apply what's called a certificate of need. And I have to say why this is needed for the community, not what, why this is needed for my business, why this is good for my business, why this is, but why I need this for the community, so-called collectivized, right? Collectivized. Precisely. And then other hospitals who are competing with me get to file to say why they don't think I need it. Right. And the state decides how many hospital beds I will have in the end. Mm -hmm. So the reason we have seen a shrinking number of hospital beds is because the state has purposefully shrunk the number of beds in our system. And because yeah. remember, the US government is the biggest buyer of healthcare in the US. It, of every dollar spent on healthcare, probably over 60% is spent, 60 cents is spent by the government. So we already have socialized healthcare in the United States. Um, and that has crippled our ability to respond. It's crippled up the ability of hospitals to prepare. It's crippled the ability of insurance companies to be prepared for pandemics and things like that. Agreed. Agreed. And we become more and more dependent on government. Agreed. And therefore government finds itself in a position where it has to act because the private sector can't because the FDA is banded and the state governments are banded and the health, you know, so it, 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 we're in a position where government has to do something because mm -hmm. nobody else is allowed to do anything. Mm -hmm. And that's what's the real evil.
yeah. that has been revealed in this pandemic right. is how dependent we are when it comes to a health perspective, when it comes to a medical perspective on right. government. And, and we know how incompetent government and, is when it comes to things that it's not and, good and at doing. Indeed, if I might add, you've had, you've had several instances in, in notwithstanding government uh, dictates to the contrary of private individuals uh, manifesting their own wills and power to assist uh, heartbroken and, and, and sick and lethargic people during this time. And you've had charities, you've had a, there was this lady, uh, a professor in New York who actually uh, called out to China, to the East, or her contacts over there in Hong Kong. And she got a bunch of face masks delivered to New York. So you've had, I mean, private, well, do you, do you know how the first cases of, of the virus in the U.S., of community transmission of the virus in the U.S. were discovered? I do not know. So it was a woman, uh, I think her name was Margaret Chu, in, um, in Seattle. And she was, doing, she was doing a study on the flu. Mm. So she had this testing kit, and she was, she was having people test for the flu. And she discovered people who were testing negative for the flu but had these flu-like symptoms. And she had heard about what was going on in China. And she suspected that they had COVID-19. So she went to the government and said, look, what I'd like, these people have not traveled. They're just in Seattle. They haven't gone anywhere, but I think they have COVID-19. I'd like to take my test equipment and modify it to test for COVID-19. And the government came back and said, well, no, I mean, we gave you a grant to study flu. We didn't give you a grant to study COVID-19. So no, you can't change. And she went, she said, look, there's a pandemic. It's in China. I'd like to see if it's here. No, they wouldn't allow it. So in the end, and, and this went back and forth yeah. for a while, in the end, she said, to hell with you. And by breaking her contract, breaking the law, if you will, she revised her testing equipment to test for COVID-19. She went out there and tested, and she found the first positive cases of community transmitted COVID-19 in the United States. Mm -hmm. And she changed, you know, I think she saved Seattle and Washington from a horrible, horrible uh, outcome. So it's people taking their own initiative in spite of government, uh, you know, obstacles. Look at the testing. Private companies, as soon as they were asked to device testing, did it like this. But from weeks in February and early March, the government did not allow them to develop tests. It was only going to be an FDA CDC test. There wasn't going to be a, 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 a private testing allowed. Right. And as a consequence, we fell behind by at least a month in our testing capabilities, our testing capacities, which explains a lot of the negative outcomes that have Indeed. happened, the, the awful deaths that have happened uh, in this. So it is, we, you know, this country um, and the world, the world relies on private initiative uh, in fighting these kind of things. It's only capitalism that can actually save us from this. Inherently, yeah. yeah, inherently. Before any governments were instituted, all absolutely. we did was private, absolutely, inherently, absolutely. Um, let's, let's go back to contra-tracing for like a few moments because I just want to touch on that a little bit more. So you say it should be delimited. It should be confined to a particular circumstance and bound by criteria. Uh, my question would be, would you include in this theoretical criteria or what have you, if we were to, if we were to introduce, institute this nationally, there's a lot of resistance to it, but institute this nationally, would you include a undiluted deference to the infected person's desire to, be, to disclose their status or not? Because it could theoretically be argued that, that a matter of individual privacy, the government and a lot of people around, around the person uh, don't want to have that information revealed for either purposes of avoiding so, social stigmatization, purposes of avoiding shame. I don't, of I don't think so. I, I mean, again, if you're infected, and again, you'd have to decide how deadly a disease was to, in order to implement this and so on. But if you're infected and potentially could be killing people or putting them in hospital or damaging them significantly, you lose, in a sense, the, the, that right for privacy. Um, and, 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 and because you know, no fault of your own granted, but, but you are infected and you have interacted with other people. And I think it's completely legitimate for the, for the court, to, for court to issue, let's say a warrant to, to, uh, uh, access your phone, to, to figure out where, who you interacted with or you've been or flights you've flown on recently. Um, again, not as a, not as a form of punishment, but as a, a way to, to protect other people from the potential that you have infringed on their rights. All right. Uh, that's a very interesting viewpoint. Absolutely. Um, and amongst, amongst the limited government folks, amongst the natural, uh, no, not natural rights, but among individual rights folks. Ima imagine uh, if this was a disease not, that, yeah. that killed 30% of the people that, that were infected by it. 
and that if you caught it early enough, you could save people's lives. But the longer you waited, the more likely it was that you would oh, die. Oh, absolutely. I think Wouldn't there is a. Ever, you know, then then. I think there is absolutely. Somebody a place. says, "I don't want you to know where I've been the last month." I mean, first of all, it's not public information. We're not letting the whole world know where you've been. Law enforcement officers would get that information, and then or, or officers responsible for this particular activity would then trace the people you've interacted with, and then destroy the information. That would be the mandate. It wouldn't be put it up on a website, let everybody know where you've been and who you've been with. Uh, how, how do you find all those people? What's that? Uh, how do you find all those people? If someone is a speaker like you and they, in, in a month, they've had several speaking engagements that have yielded theoretically over a but, thousand. But look folks. at South Korea. They've done a phenomenal job at it. They found the people, they've asked them to self isolate. They've asked them to quarantine and they have managed to quell this co Corona virus completely. It's, it's almost non-existence in South Korea because they managed to do that. To some extent, Japan did the same thing. Certainly, Taiwan has been brilliant at this and, and have done a very good job. And again, without the kind of travel bans and without the kind of restrictions and lockdowns that we have seen, without the real violations of rights that we've seen in the United States and in Europe, they have managed to, to crush this disease in ways that we haven't by exactly doing this, by, by tracking, isolate, by, by tracking and isolating. Look, if I spoke at an event, we know who was at the event. Maybe there was a sign-up sheet. We asked the organizers of the event to email all the people who were there, telling them, hey, your aunt was infected. You might have gotten this. Uh, please self-isolate. Go see a doctor and get tested. Everybody has then a self-interest to do that. It's pretty straightforward. It's pretty easy. Uh, if I was on a flight, we know who was on the flight. They all get an email. They all get the same thing. People try to go to them and get them tested. We do all this. It requires a lot of manpower. It requires a huge infrastructure. But that's what the government is for. It's, it's the, you, you know, look at war is the same thing. You Big infrastructure, a lot of people, and, and the government, you know, puts in the resources and does that. These are the only things we should have government for. Right? Okay. If they Absolutely. focus just on this, they'd be good at it. Fair point. This is quite an iconoclastic view, as I'm sure you know, amongst the individual rights folks. But no, I, I appreciate it because these are the kind of conversations that folks who genuinely care about human liberty need to be having. Absolutely. in my opinion. So let's talk about capitalism's uh, role in all of this, because as I mentioned before, the uh, Miss Cho in uh, Seattle and the person who lady who reached out to her Hong Kong contacts to get face masks from the government when, when New York hospitals are begging for the government for face masks and the government said, nope, our stockpile is limited. We're not, we're going to give you about 50 when we have about thousand patients who are dying on the bed. Not only, I mean, they may, that is, those are the instances of the capitalistic spirit. Because in my opinion, there is a sort of spirit or essence behind the idea of capitalism, even if it doesn't manifest in the form of transactions or, 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 or profit producing. The, the idea of the, the entrepreneurial motive to go out and do things on your, own, uh, on your own to benefit other individuals and also benefit yourself, in my opinion, captures the essence of capitalism. So for you, in your opinion, would this not to the rational person convey that the, that the capitalism that has been vilified and attacked and harangued and lanced by so many in intelligentsia, so many quote unquote intellectuals who rely on straw man and so on to attack capitalism, that it is actually working and it manifests independently amongst each of us individually. And especially during times of crisis, we have the ability to tap into that power and exude it outwards to help, to, 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 you know, help, uh, help further individual rights across the board. I mean, I mean, absolutely. And it, it, it strikes me as, as bizarre that we need times of crisis to see this because all the values we have are products of individual initiative, everything from, you know, mm -hmm. we're, we're Zooming now. I mean, this so, video yeah. conference could not be possible without Zoom, without Precisely. a company and an entrepreneur and a venture capitalist and, and people who work for, the, for that company and, and their individual initiative in, in creating the different features that Zoom has and so on. And that's true of the camera I'm using and the monitor I'm using and the, and, the, and the microphone I'm using and the light that we have. Where would we be without Edison and Westinghouse and, <laughs> and the competition between them and, and to, to electrify the country? I mean, it's all about and you can go. And the only reason socialist and communist countries can survive even a little bit is because they steal either the products that, and, and the ideas that have been created in the West or they live off of. The, the, the legacy of the products and, and creations of their own country from before. It's parasitic. Communist and socialist. Mm -hmm. The government doesn't create, produce anything. And I mean, it might fund a university where good things are created. It might fund a lab where good things are created. But 
uh, it in and of itself as a collectivistic um, uh, enterprise guided by a gun, guided by coercion of force, doesn't produce and create and innovate. So all of our lives around us is, are products of some individualistic spirit, some entrepreneurial spirit. And I wouldn't call it quite capitalism because I think capitalism is the system. Mm -hmm. But it is the self-interested, entrepreneurial, self-driven spirit that makes, you know, the guy who, who came up with fire and figured it out and, and figured mm -hmm. out how to, how to harness it. Uh, the Prometheus of his time. Yeah, story of Prometheus, absolutely. I mean, yeah. Every single one of these are individuals who had a mind, who thought for themselves, who were independent, individual, independent thinkers who, who cared about their own life and by extension, human life. So capitalism is just the system that leaves us free to do all that. Mm -hmm. Capitalism is a very simple system. It simply says, we're not going to intervene in your ability to live your life in your ra pursuit of rational values. And hey, if you pursue irrational values, that's the cost. Leaving you free to do that is the cost of allowing people to pursue the rational values. That's so true. yes, some people are going to make mistakes. Some people are going to screw up. But the only way we can let the people who are going to achieve be successful, the only way we're going to allow them to be free is by letting everybody be free. Absolutely. And uh, I think I think this pandemic has shown that a lot of uh, that the capitalistic spirit, I would say, and, I, and when I say that, I simply mean the initiative and the drive behind producing things for value. That sure. spirit has been shuttered by a lot of, we're not sure, it's been, it's been greatly inhibited by a lot of governments. Oh, absolutely. Uh, a, a, a lot of state governments, including here in Georgia, where, where I, I currently reside. I mean, my governor, Brian Kempe, has been better than most governors. He yep. actually has caught a lot of heat for opening up the state. A lot yes. of the president has attacked him and everything but I, I personally i am i am largely pleased with a lot of what he's done uh but even even he is still banning buffets he is still doing a lot of things uh, that, but businesses and, uh, and creators they are they are quickly they are strategizing re-strategizing and changing their ways but my question my question is this though if even if we didn't have if we had if we didn't have a lockdown, can we not presume that value creators, businesses, firm owners have an interest in not getting their customer base sick, and therefore would take actions to, to the contrary of getting them sick? They'd probably enforce distance rules, have people wear masks when they come in, and maybe have a fever test. Or, I mean, you don't need the government to actually no. really come in and say not shut in a down. free society, right? But we don't live in a free society, unfortunately. But yes, unfortunately, I mean, if you think about it, the first companies to ask people to work at home and actually require most of their staff to work at home were Microsoft and Amazon. And they, they did that voluntarily because they got a call from the people in the health department in Washington state saying, look, there's this virus out, you know, you know, it's, it's just beginning, but we need, we need to keep people home. And it would be helpful if you took the lead on this and Microsoft and Amazon called their employees and said, stay home. And that was, and I think as information would have gotten out there, some restaurants would have closed, some restaurants would have adjusted their seating areas and, and, their, and, their, and their behavior, but some would have closed because, it, 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 and some customers wouldn't have gone to restaurants. They, I mean, there's no question that the consumption of restaurants, the consumption of different products would have dropped. And many are still Change. closed too. Many are still closed despite the lockdowns being- Malls, lifted. you wouldn't have gone to malls. Mall owners would have- I mean, there are whole mechanisms by which voluntarily we would adapt it. And the structure of demand in our society would have changed. And so the supply would have adjusted. And yes. So, yes, all of this could have been done voluntarily. But more than that, if the government would have done the testing and tracking and the isolating, if we, we had a private healthcare system that actually was allowed to ramp up to uh, take New York, where, where this, this thing hit really, really hard, and where, literally, you know, where this was a real catastrophe, and where maybe they would have had to have had lockdowns, uh, given the failure to, to, do this, to do the testing early. But if New York hospitals would have been prepared, if New York hospitals would have had more beds, if New York hospitals would have had more PP&E, um, and were allowed to buy more PP&E in the market and pay the market prices, if people were allowed to gouge, I mean, one of the essential things that has to happen in a, in a crisis is gotcha. price gouging. Yep. Price gouging mm -hmm. is good for a crisis. 100%. If all this was allowed to actually happen, then you would have seen that the response of capitalism to this, the response of free people, free initiative 
and the price mechanism and the system of supply and demand, the adjustment of supply and demand would have been a beautiful thing. And it would have coped with this yes. far, far better than the pathetic centrally planned response that we have seen throughout this country and really throughout and, the world. And on that point, uh, a, a, ca a casualty of the, uh, of the capitalist, uh, not, not the capitalist, of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of, of the subversion of the capitalistic system, in my opinion, was the oil prices. I'm sure you, as a hedge fund manager, you know the oil prices dropped to zero dollars and negative. Oh, they were 32. negative. Yeah, negative 32.65%. People, were paying people to get rid of their futures Absolutely. contract. Yeah, precisely. I want to talk about that. So, and, and this is our, will be our last question before we wrap up. Sure. It was funny to me, not the, the effects of it are certainly not funny. They're not funny at all. But what was funny was that you had these firms trying to subsidize people to get the oil off, off out of their storages by subsidizing the cost of shipping and all that kind of sure. stuff. Sure. But in my opinion, that absolutely rejected the fundamental idea that undergirds every single interaction. That is personal values. Right now, from what I understand, firms don't really value oil right now. They value the health of their employees and their safety. And so is this fundamental uh, sort of misrecon uh, an inability to see that value matters and undergirds interactions, is that, has that been uh, magnetized and amplified under the coronavirus situation? And if so, do you think that firms who are who endeavor to get oil off the uh, uh, off their storages should uh, so should what should they do in your opinion? Well, look, I I think that the whole way in which we approach economic issues, including oil today, is collectivized and is viewed mm, through indeed. collective lens, not the view of of of, uh, of individualistic lens. The whole oil crisis, there would have been an oil crisis anyway, but the whole oil crisis was exacerbated by the fact that much of oil supply is provided by states and not by a competitive, uh, you know, uh, uh, corporate driven market. So the fact that Saudi Arabia and Russia and OPEC can negotiate uh, so in, and rather than have, uh, imagine if Saudi Arabian oil was owned by a variety of different private companies as it should be. Yes. Imagine if Russian oil was owned by a variety of different Russian enterprises, then you know, the market would determine what actually happened in the market. What actually happened in the market because of coronavirus and because of the shutdowns and because of everything else is demand for oil plummeted. That is mm -hmm. how Indeed. the value of oil to us Precisely. on a day-to-day -day basis declined because we had no use for it. I'm not driving anywhere, right? right. And, and um, you know, so it's, it's actually, and of course, there's less production going on. So there's less need for right. energy to drive the economy. So the demand plummeted. And instead of the supply adjusting, which is what usually happens, right? Demand plummets, prices go down, people shut down production, supply, so supply is reduced and then prices bounce up until they reach equilibrium. Right. Something like that typically happens. What happened here is for political reasons, for reasons that have nothing to do with supply and demand, the Saudis and the Russians kept pumping and kept right. lowering the prices lower and lower and lower. Makes no sense. Beyond the role of what demand actually demand, requires. No sense. And that, what that happened then is, because there's no demand, but people are still producing, which is not the way our market works, what happened was inventories kept going larger and larger and larger. Storage facilities kept getting full. And it reached a point where people were expecting delivery of oil, and they had nowhere to put it. Precisely. They couldn't take delivery of it, right? So they basically said the people who are going to deliver it, keep it. I'll pay you to keep it, because <laughs> I don't have anywhere to put it. Now, that is an example of a market breaking down, but not breaking down for any market-driven reason, breaking because down because of the wall. And remember, this is also the time where Trump is trying to negotiate a deal with the Saudis and, and the Russians. And for somebody who is being hyped as a great deal maker, he's one of the most pathetic deal makers I've ever seen. <laughs> oh, my Lord. Caves to the Democrats oh. every single time. I know, you're correct. Caves <laughs> to the North Koreans. And in this case, he caved oh, to the Saudis and the Russians. So all of this politicization of oil, you know, created a situation where the market couldn't price oil well, and it created this, this breakage of the, of the oil market. But that's politics. That's not economics. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that if these, if these governments recognize the fundamental nature of human value and that humans tend to value things that are proportional to the circumstances that they have, they, this situation would have been much Well, they would have shot themselves because they are, they <laughs> oh are my. both authoritarian oh my. governments that are anti-human oh. life, anti-individualism, anti-markets, anti-capitalism. And if they actually valued human life, the first thing they would do would be to commit 
mass suicide because the, their very existence, the king of Saudi Arabia, I thought we got rid of kings hundreds of years ago or the, or the dictator yeah. of Russia yeah. should House not exist. Capital, you yeah. know, they should privatize the economies and get out of the way. They should yeah. disappear into the sunset. Give back the money they stole from their people, by the way. I appreciate your very irreverent views, Mr. Mr. Brook. <laughs> they are always nice and they're well needed in this, in this time. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. I hope I My can pleasure. have you back in the future. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks for sir. having me on and, and uh, stay healthy and stay, stay safe. Absolutely. Have, okay. have a nice day, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye.